All right, welcome everyone. I'm Holly Gersbacher, Director of Alumni Relations here at WIT and an alumna from the class of 2003. We're so glad you all could join us for this timely conversation. And we're grateful that Professor Christian Raffensperger, leading, leading Russia and Ukraine historian, who is also currently the Archie K. Davis Fellow at the National Humanities Center and Kenneth E. Ray Chair in the Humanities and Chair of the History Department here at WIT, has volunteered some of his time for us today. As you know, this session will be recorded and posted on our Alumni College Archive page. Please type your questions in the chat as they come up and we'll review them after the presentation. And without further ado, please help me welcome Professor Christian Raffensperger. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your day today to come and join uh, us as we talk about this topic. I'm going to try and answer a few questions, uh, specifically three, about what is going on in Ukraine and the historical context, and then leave time for your questions. My goal is to look at kind of the, uh, as I said, the context for the situation rather than the up to the minute what's happening right now, though certainly we can talk about that in the questions. Uh, and Holly, if it suits you, I'm going to address three questions and then maybe I'll pause after each question. We can uh, then do your audience questions and then wrap up at the end. Sound good? That sounds perfect. Terrific. Um, first off, I want to note that Putin is not crazy. Um, this is something that people keep saying. He's crazy. He's mad. He's out of his mind. He, he's really not. Um, he actually has his own ideas about the way the world works. Um, and the other thing is, um, he keeps telling us uh, what it is that he's going to do. As far back as the year 2000, he was giving speeches talking about the historical unity of Russia and Ukraine. Um, we didn't listen. Um, in 2021, he published a whole essay on the presidential website uh, that was also in the, some of the papers and now has become required reading for uh, both the military and the secondary education programs in Russia called On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, when he talked to French uh, leader Macron uh, last week, uh, he was given, Macron said, a history lecture. Right. And so he actually genuinely cares about history. And that's how he views all of this stuff that's been going on. We have not been paying attention in part because as, as Americans, we don't particularly value history in that same way. Um, and we think it must be some ruse or a guise or something like that. Instead, he's saying exactly what he means. And so the first question I want to address is the big one of what does Putin want? Well, actually, Putin seems to genuinely believe that the Russians and Ukrainians are one people. Uh, they are one historical group that has been divided through happenstance over time. Uh, in fact, here, I apologize. Let me share my screen so you can see uh, some of these pictures. All right. Holly, can you confirm we can see that? Yes, we can. All right. Brilliant. All right. Um, so this is Vladimir Putin with his famous big table. And actually, you know, before we get into our first question, this is another of these uh, major problems with Putin right now is ever since COVID, he has become increasingly isolated. He's terrified of COVID. Um, and so this table is not just a sign of his power. It's a way of keeping people quite distant. Uh, if you want to see him, you have to self-isolate for a week um, or go through these uh, misting, um, you know, de-germifying kinds of things and all of this. So it is in making him increasingly isolated. All right, but coming back to our first question, what does Putin want? Um, he believed, for instance, that the Ukrainians that are in the east of the country would welcome him with open arms. And I just wanna take a few minutes and talk about why that might be. And of course, of course, I'm gonna use maps. All of those uh, students out there who suffered through my map quizzes, right? This is where the payoff comes in. Um, so this is a map of medieval Europe. And you can see to the right of your screen, Kievan Rus, north of the Black Sea, uh, south of the Baltic Sea. And Kievan Rus was a polity in the Middle Ages that was um, a, at the time a kingdom but it would eventually become the root, the base for the later nation states of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. All three can claim it as their heritage. None of them have sole property of it. But this existence of Rus is something that Vladimir Putin and other Russians over the years have used as a way to try and claim territory in Ukraine in the area around the Dnieper River. 
And the Dnieper River flows south into the Black Sea through some really important cities like Kiev uh, and um, Kherson, right, that we're going to see in the news a lot lately. Now, over time, we see Kiev and Rus split, uh, and there are going to be places in the north, there are places in the northeast, there are places in the southwest going their own directions. And so we can fast forward a little bit through time and see, for instance, a map of the 17th century, where now we've got an expanding Muscovy. So we've moved into the time of Moscow as a predominant power. It's moving towards the Dnieper River, and you can see that stretch across the map towards the Dnieper River to gather in some of that territory. And even in the 17th century, what the Russians were were saying at the time was we are trying to reclaim Rus, right? So this is a, a, a heritage of calling back to Rus and saying that is our territory. Right? It, it, it's not. It's the historical territory that was the root of all three Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians. But this was an argument for conquest as early as the 17th century. The other thing to note here, and you'll see this in news reports today, is that when we talk about Ukraine, we often talk about it oriented around the Dnieper River. The Dnieper River flows to the south, and so we actually have to kind of um, confront our north is up uh, ideas about maps and flip ourselves around and look south. If you look the way the Dnieper River is flowing, imagine you're 100 feet tall and you can straddle the river looking south. Left bank Ukraine is in the east, right bank Ukraine is in the west. Left bank Ukraine, as you can see on the map here, has become part of Muscovy by the 17th century. Uh, we'll see that continue to be part of Muscovy in the 18th century, whereas right bank Ukraine is part of Poland-Lithuania. And that territory of Poland-Lithuania is going to exist for a long time, and it will not be quite common to have right bank Ukraine and left bank Ukraine under the same territories. Why is this important? Well, even today in left bank Ukraine, the eastern part of the country, Russian is a more common language. President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine is a native Russian speaker. Um, he won, uh, actually he won in all the districts of Ukraine, his presidential election, but he received especially high vote totals in the East, right? And so there is this idea of Russian language, disconnected from identity, disconnected from ethnicity, right? But language being more common in East and left bank Ukraine. We see, of course, the same thing here, moving into the 18th century, the left bank Ukrainian territory is part of the Russian Empire of Peter the Great, uh, the right bank territory is part of Poland, Lithuania. Right, so we're going to see a division between those territories. All of this is really just in aid of explaining that Ukraine is not Russia. It really isn't. Historically speaking, Russia has tried to take over that territory. Russia has tried to utilize historical arguments to own and possess that territory, but in no way is it um, the property of Russia, right? It is its own thing. And in fact, um, last night I was talking uh, to a group from through the National Humanities Center, um, and we dug down really deep to look at some of these incidents that happened in the 17th and 18th centuries where the Russians moved into these regions, took power, and gathered more territory for themselves. But it's really not until uh, the modern period that Russia controls all of this territory. So this is actually a relatively recent historical accomplishment for the Russians to control Ukrainian territory. But even then, it's conceptual conceptualized as Ukrainian territory, not as just another part of Russia. The map in front of you, though, is, has one other thing that I should mention, and that's when Peter the Great takes this territory, he begins creating names uh, for these groups called Little Russians, and, and he was the ruler of Russians, uh, pardon me, Great Russians, Little Russians, and White Russians, and the Great Russians are the Russians, the Little Russians are the name for the Ukrainians that the Great Russians prefer, and the White Russians are the Belarusians, right? That's literally what Belarus means, or the White uh, White Russians, or White Rus, if we just say Belarus rather than Belarusia. Uh, so this is, from this time, a claim to that authority. And as you can tell from the map, Belarus isn't controlled by the Russians, and only part of Ukraine is, but they are making claims to control that territory as a way to gather it under themselves.
So what does Putin want? Well, he wants the same thing that a lot of these past rulers have wanted. He wants to control all of this East Slavic territory. The fact that Lukashenko in Belarus is already basically beholden to him and does what he wants, participating in the invasion, for instance, um, means that Belarus is, is safe in that regard. But the Ukrainians certainly aren't. Um, and he would like to bring them into the orbit of Russia and return to the days of himself being the ruler of Great Russia, Little Russia, and White Russia. All right, so I'm going to stop there as that first question uh, and see if we have questions from the audience. We currently don't have any questions in the chat. All right. Probably because you just want me to spell some of those names. I tried to keep names to a minimum so that you would not ask me how to spell them. All right, so that's our first question. Um, keep asking uh, questions if you want. We're gonna move on to our second question. Our second question is why does Putin keep talking about denazification of Ukraine, right? Um, the point was made very early, three weeks ago today, that this doesn't make any sense. The president of Ukraine is Jewish. How could he possibly be a Nazi? Well, all of this goes back actually, unsurprisingly perhaps, to World War II. In World War II, uh, there were fascist groups all over. There were fascist groups in the United States. There were fascist groups all over Europe. Uh, we've got, of course, the National Socialists and the Italian fascists. But then we also see groups such as uh, the Iron Guard in Romania, the Arrow Cross Party in Hungary. And in Ukraine, the fascist group is called the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. And at the time, Ukraine was split between the Soviet Union, and it was a, a Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic within the Soviet Union, but then there was a portion of Ukraine as well that was, in, was within Poland. And the OUN, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, was active in both of those places. After 1939, when the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between the Soviets and the Nazis was activated and both parties invaded and divided Poland between the two of them, the OUN collaborated with the Nazis. Particularly, they were interested in undermining the Soviet Union, and they had the goal of creating an independent Ukrainian state. Now, move forward to 1941, once Stalin invades, uh, pardon me, once Hitler invades the Soviet Union, um, the OUN declares an independent Ukraine. They feel like this is their moment. And the capital of their independent Ukraine is in Lviv, in the far west of Ukraine. They admitted this would be subordinate to the Nazis. They were not trying to get out from under the Nazis. Hitler, however, was not interested in having an independent Ukraine whatsoever. And he had the Gestapo arrest the most belligerent of the OUN members, uh, in particular, the leader of the nationalist faction, Stepan Bandera. And this is this uh, handsome fascist right in front of us in the picture. Bandera was sent to Sachsenhausen concentration camp where he was held until 1944. Others of, of the OUN, including two of his brothers, were sent elsewhere, uh, including uh, two of his brothers ended up uh, being killed at Auschwitz. Um, this, which should also bring us to anti-Semitism. While not initially anti-Semitic, the OUN, um, through one of their military arms, is going to end up participating with the Nazi SS in killing thousands of Jews on Ukrainian territory. The OUN and the UPA, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, will end up actually killing even more Poles than Jews, uh, tens of thousands of Poles, mostly women and children, because this is wartime and the men are off fighting elsewhere and they're raiding villages. Uh, the goal of the OUN in those killings was the removal of anyone they viewed as non-Ukrainian from Ukrainian territory. Now, Sachsenhausen, uh, Bandera is released from Sachsenhausen in 1944 because Hitler is losing the war and he wants to foment discord within the Soviet Union. So he sends Bandera to Ukraine to try and create an independence movement that is going to cause trouble for the Soviets. Uh, this is going to work out well for Bandera, um, and he and the Ukrainian insurgent army will kill Poles, Russians, Jews, most anyone who wasn't Ukrainian in a mission to create a Ukrainian state that was independent of anyone else. Now, once the conclusion of victory in Europe was achieved, 
he kept fighting. And in fact, in the early days of the post-war period after uh, summer 1945, it's widely alleged that both the American and British intelligence services supported Bandera with arms and training and money uh, to continue his fight against the Soviet Union, right? Paying no attention to uh, his fascist ties uh, from before the war. Eventually, Bandera will be assassinated by the Soviets, though not until the 1950s. Now, I've given you a picture here of Bandera, but I've also given you a picture of a leaflet that was an OUN leaflet from the 1930s, and it says, Slava Ukraina, uh, Geroyim Slava, right? Uh, I would love to be able to call on someone to translate this, but I know I'm not going to do that. This is an alumni talk. Right. Um, so glory to Ukraine, uh, glory to the heroes. Right. And I put this up here because this is a 1930s piece of OUN propaganda. In fact, on the shield, you can see OUN. Right. Um, and this is 1930s propaganda making a comeback today. Uh, in fact, maybe you see this as well. I certainly see it in the news that I read. Slava Ukraina and glory to Ukraine is very popular. This is coming up all the time in people who are defending Ukraine. So hold that in your head for just a minute. The legacy of Ukraine is really going to be important. I mean, the legacy of Bandera is going to be really important. In post-1991 Ukraine, right after the fall of the Soviet Union, the OUN becomes the sponsor of a political party, and they even play a small role in elections. They don't get much. Um, in the 2018 presidential elections, in fact, they get less than 1%, which is far less than such far-right parties as the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland uh, in Germany. But in the mind of Putin, it's this organization that is behind the 2014 Maidan demonstrations that ousted his favored candidate, Viktor Yanukovych. Now, the real rationale for the uh, 2014 Maidan demonstrations was Yanukovych's refusal to sign the EU association agreement, which would put the uh, Ukraine on a path to joining the EU. However, for Putin, this was a sign of the continuation of OUN ideas and because of his ideas that the OUN was backed by the West, right, that this same thing had happened in 2014. Now, Bandera adds into this as well, because as you can see right here, there is a statue to uh, Bandera in Ukraine. And in fact, there isn't just one of them. There are a couple of dozen statues of Stepan Bandera in Ukraine. There are streets named after him. There are all kinds of Bandera memorials in Ukraine. And in fact, uh, in the first decade of the 21st century, the president at the time, Viktor Yushchenko, gave Stepan Bandera the title Hero of Ukraine, which created a huge backlash among Russians, Poles, Jews, as well as many Ukrainians, uh, and was eventually revoked by the next president. But this legacy is going to be particularly difficult to overcome. And so, for instance, if you are Putin and you have a historical mindset, but you also have perhaps a conspiratorial mindset, and you see a Ukraine that doesn't want to be part of Russia, right, and you see Slava Ukraina, and you see monuments to Bandera, Right. The connections are there. Right. He's making those connections that this is a fascist group with ties back to what had happened before. And because it's a fascist group, it must it must have sponsorship from the West. And this is one of the main points that Putin keeps emphasizing is that in 2014 with the Maidan. That fascists took control of the Ukrainian government, backed by the Americans and the British, and that he is going to free the Ukrainians from that. Right? So this is a big part of why he keeps saying he wants to denazify Ukraine. Right? So, so that's my second question I'm trying to answer for you. Questions? Yes, we do have some questions. One moment. All right, the first one is, is it fair to see Putin in the same light as the czars and not like Stalin? His policy is certainly czarist expansionist in nature. 
Yeah, I think actually he views himself um, and he would, I think, view it as a continuum uh, from Stalin back through the czars as well. Um, much like Stalin, uh, he wrote a new history of the uh, Russian Empire and of Russia that glorifies Stalin and puts him back on a pedestal and puts the... Um, accomplishments of the Soviet Union in favor and really kind of minimizes all the bad things, you know, killing tens of thousands of dissidents and the gulag and all of those sorts of things. So he very much views it as a spectrum of greatness all the way through from the, the medieval past through to the present inclusive of the Soviet Union. Thank you. Next question is, what doesn't Putin want? Putin doesn't want a widespread nuclear war. He doesn't want war with the West. Um, and if we look back to some of the events of the past two decades, we can see little things that'll help tell us this. And I say little because they're not as relevant to us in America, although they had a major impact on other people's lives. So for instance, in 2008, he invaded Georgia. Um, and actually uh, he uh, invaded Georgia in, in the summer. And I had a student at the time at Wittenberg um, who was a Marine reservist and he and his Marines were doing training missions in Georgia, helping to train the Georgian army. Uh, and he told me when he got back that they got a call to bug out in the middle of the night. They grabbed what they could carry. They got on a boat and they were in the middle of the Black Sea um, when they got the news that Georgia had been invaded. And the people that they had just been working with, just been training, were fighting for their lives against the Russians. His story was poignant. Um, the United States had chosen to evacuate U.S. servicemen from a military conflict zone it knew was going to happen so that it would not get drawn into the conflict. What happened in 2008? Well, Russia got a slap on the wrist, but they managed to invade and take a couple chunks of Georgia, uh, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, uh, that are going to claim for itself as theoretically independent territories. The same thing happened in 2014 when they invaded and took Crimea and a couple of territories in Ukraine. And again, they got a slap on the wrist and a few sanctions, but the West largely let it go. And so Putin had no reason to suspect that this would go any differently, especially since he, he seemed to really believe that once he rolled into eastern Ukraine in particular, that the Russian speakers of eastern Ukraine would welcome him as a liberator from these people who had taken over in 2014. Thank you. Next question is, what will Putin's next, what will be Putin's next target if he gets what he wants from Ukraine? Will he go after a NATO member like Estonia if NATO doesn't stand up to him in Ukraine? I think no, not at all. I don't think he would go against a NATO member because it seems like the NATO forces, the EU, the United States, all of these various groups acting separately and collectively have said that they will draw a hard line. I mean, just today, the British have deployed more anti-aircraft batteries to Poland. The United States has 5,000 plus soldiers there. Um, much more likely would be Moldova, uh, honestly. Since 1992, uh, Russia has had what's called a frozen conflict zone in Moldova called Transdenistria. Moldova has been present, prevented, therefore, from becoming a member of NATO or the EU. And so that could be another country, much like Ukraine, that could be absorbed into the Russian territory. I, I feel like that and Georgia are kind of on the outer edge of likeliness. Much more likely would be the incorporation of Belarus as a new province of Russia. Great. We have um, quite a few more messages. The next one is, uh, why is he bombing and destroying Ukraine and killing those people if he ultimately wants that land and to rule the people? He's driving them out and killing them and destroying the country. If he does win, what does he end up with? Just more land that's destroyed? Yeah, and that's a great point and a great question. Um, this is actually a pretty typical Russian way of waging war in the, the 21st century. Um, the attempt and the ideal was what's often been called, again, with a throwback to World War II, a blitzkrieg, uh, a move in, the Ukrainian army would crumble and the Russians would take control of population centers like Kharkiv and Kiev and Odessa, and they would dominate the country and keep it intact. Because they've been unable to do that, they've resorted to the same tactic they've engaged in in Syria, for instance, where they just bomb the entire population. They bomb all of the population centers and eventually they will then force the population to bow 
in that way. But you're right. Uh, and Mariupol is a great example on the South Coast. Mariupol has been taken, but the mayor has stood up and defended the city uh, rhetorically. Uh, he was captured and, and kidnapped for that, but eventually released because of international pressure. Uh, people have turned out into the streets with Ukrainian flags protesting. Uh, honestly, I don't think he has any uh, conception or ha had any conception of what he was getting himself into. And, and honestly, Western military analysts didn't either. They all expected the Ukraine to fold. And so what is he going to get? That's a great question. People don't know that answer. The Ukrainians are united in a way that they have probably never been before. Um, and whatever he gets is going to find tough to swallow. Great. Would you go so far as to say that the fixation on statues mirrors the movements here to bring down statues that are no longer culturally relevant? Uh, potentially, and, and here's the link. Um, so if the statue to Stepan Bandera had been erected in 1946 when he was actively opposing the Soviet Union, it would be a statue erected at that time and culturally relevant. For instance, if we had a, the comparand would be uh, a Civil War statue erected in uh, you know, 1865 or something like that. Um, but instead, much like the Civil War statues, the Civil War statues were largely erected at the end of the 19th and the early 20th century as a way to demonstrate a continuation of white power and to show that, you know, Black people should stay in their place. Um, this Bandera statue, like so many others, is brand new, and they've been elect erected in the last 20 years as a way to claim the past and send a signal. And that signal is not well received by so many people, whether it's Jews, Poles, Russians, or even Ukrainians who don't like fascists. Next question is, uh, given that Putin has this denazification stance, can we see a chance that he would invade or take a military hostile stance toward Germany because of the existence of the AFD as a legitimate political party or not, since they're not in the general sphere of what he wants to control? not because they're not in a general sphere of what he wants to control. And he generally, I don't think, wants to engage with NATO. The repercussions are too severe, especially, I would say, given the poor, poor performance of his military thus far. Um, if he can't beat the Ukrainians who are using um, secondhand resources from the United States and other countries, there's no way he could stand up to the actual military might of, of the United States. I mean, there was just a, a thing the other day, these cruise missiles that hit that Western Ukrainian um, army base where foreign fighters were being trained. These are some of the most advanced cruise missiles in the Russian arsenal, and they do deployed these drones that um, help detract from anti-aircraft fire, and no military analyst had ever seen these drones before. This was something that they'd been keeping in the pocket in case of a big war, but they're deploying it in Ukraine now. Uh, and so now American, British, and other military intelligence agencies know this exists, and they can better program things to avoid it in the future. Next question is, what would the realistic outcome be if NATO agrees to make Ukrainian airspace a no-fly zone? That's war. I mean, honestly, um, it would be great to be able to protect the Ukrainians in that way. But the way you create a no fly zone is you shoot down planes that go into it and you shoot down anti aircraft batteries. Uh, in this case, the planes are Russian and the anti aircraft batteries are Russian and there are largely going to be based in Russian territory. And so if you have US or NATO forces engaging directly with Russian forces in that way, that's war. Next is just a comment. Um, Eastern Latvia is an easy target. Just wanted to make sure that was heard and seen. Yeah. Uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia have um, a lot of legitimate fears because they are um, connected uh, very tenuously to the rest of Europe, given the Kaliningrad situation. But let's use that as a jumping off to my third and final question, and then we'll circle back for some more questions at the end, if that's all right. Perfect. All right, so my third and final question is about the same issue we've been discussing of NATO. Right. Uh, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Foundation uh, organization founded in 1949 with a goal of opposing the Soviet Union. Um, this map shows the 1990 membership of NATO, as well as the organization created by the Soviet Union to echo NATO, which was the Warsaw Pact. The idea was that NATO would be a defense of the West against the Soviet Union. And 1949 is, of course, a, a seminal year for the creation of the beginning of the Cold War. The Warsaw Pact was created a few years later as a way to kind of echo that. 
One quote that I think is really emblematic of the creation of NATO is from Lord Ismay, who's the first NATO Secretary General, and he said the purpose of NATO is to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. And this is a very post-World War II idea. The Americans have a history of going back and being isolationist. I mean, modern history would show this as well of the last decade. Um, so we got to keep them involved in what's happening. We got to keep the Russians out. And in fact, this is an idea that goes all the way back to uh, Peter the Great, that the Russians are coming. Right? And the Russians are going to come and be a, a menace on the eastern border of Europe. And of course, post-World War II, they want to keep the Germans down, and they don't want the Germans to participate in this. So the rationale, the very reason for its existence of NATO is to defend against the Soviet Union. And I chose this 1990 map for a particular reason, because in 1991, the Soviet Union disbands, right? Actually, Christmas Day, 1991, the Soviet Union is no more. Once the Soviet Union is no more, NATO has no more reason for existence, um, and NATO then should go away. Um, instead, what does NATO do? NATO expands. And this is a problem for a lot of Russians, though it is an advantage for so many Europeans, because what those Europeans wanted was security against Russia, uh, thinking and equating Russia with the Soviet Union. They wanted to be protected long term from Russia, and what they wanted was uh, membership in this bloc, and, and eventually we'll see the, the growth of the EU uh, parallel to this, but NATO is going to expand, and if you notice, and I apologize for flipping these, but if you just pay attention to where the blue is here versus where the blue is here, this is moving in a very pointed easterly direction. Whose borders is it creeping right towards? Russia's, uh, and this is not missed by Russia. So in 1991, when the Soviet Union goes away and NATO doesn't go away, the Russians feel threatened um, because they feel like it's been repurposed to target them. The fact that then these new, uh, newly independent uh, Eastern European countries and Central European countries begin joining NATO makes it even harder for them to think that it's not directed at them. The rhetoric of the United States in the immediate post-Soviet period of we won, we beat the Soviets, also creates this mentality that the Soviets and the Russians are the same thing. Right? And, and they're really not, although people like Putin are going to draw a connection between the two of them. Um, but the idea that NATO is expanding closer to the Russian borders and is a threat is something that Putin has talked about, and, and, and not just Putin. Um, a lot of the countries around the world that are supportive of him, and we mostly hear about the ones who are so supportive of Ukraine, but if you read things about what China and Chinese are saying, especially on Weibo, uh, the Ch Chinese Twitter um, or if you look at what's going on in Venezuela or India, a lot of people are saying, you know, Putin has a pretty legitimate point. I mean, if you look at NATO expansion, it's getting closer and closer to the Russian border. And what's the purpose of NATO? Well, it must be to fight Russia. And so if you're building allies closer and closer to Russia's border, what you must be preparing for is eventual war with Russia. So this is something that's been going on in his head. And if you think, too, about those frozen conflict zones that I mentioned before, the frozen conflict zones were created in Transnistria, which is a territory just to the east of Romania. Um, so to prevent further NATO incursion that way. In Georgia, which I apologize is off our map, or at least it's off where I've got all of the your pictures stacked. Yeah, it's off our map. Um, but Georgia also was a frozen conflict zone with South Ossetia and Abkhazia, so it could not join NATO or the EU. And then Ukraine, of course, had the same with Donetsk and Luhansk and then the possession of Crimea. So he was trying to build buffers around Russia, going back to the same discourse that Stalin used, uh, taking territory in Eastern Europe as a way to protect himself and provide time in case there is any invasion in the future. So this is the answer to the question of what is his big concern with NATO. And it's one of those concerns that actually seems like there is a grain of legitimacy. And much like his historical issues, it starts from a place of understanding, right, and then skews somewhere else.
And I know uh, none of you would ever dream of telling a lie, but that is exactly the basis of a good lie. You start with something that is true and then you twist it into something else. All right, so let's take some more questions if there are some. So we have quite a few. Let me open up the chat and try to catch back up where we left off. Um, okay, from your comments, are the Bandera monuments in Ukraine similar to the Confederate monuments of the US? We've kind of already addressed that, mm -hmm. meaning most Americans are not for the issues represented by the Confederacy, but there is a sense of legacy that so many find difficult to let go. Is this a similar concept that Putin has used to justify expansion, or is there an underlying strength of belief that the Bandera movement across Ukraine that is not fully represented in elections? It's a good question, and I think that that um, it is similar in the sense that a lot of will generalize and say Southerners think of Confederate monuments and they don't think of slavery. Uh, they think of people who fought. Um, but of course, for a lot of other people, it's impossible to not see the slavery involved in that. In the same way, Bandera monuments could mean for a certain portion of the population, Ukrainian uh, nationhood, nationalism. Um, but given that he killed tens of thousands of Poles, of Jews, of Russians, there's no way to, to escape that. So it is a really contested legacy. But I can see the idea that there is a, a link in ways that people might look at this in a certain way if they ignore all the rest. Next question is, uh, do you think the Ukrainians remember Bandera's Nazi ties as Putin seems to? No. Um, I, I think most Ukrainians don't think about Bandera, um, but it is not just Bandera. So um, in um, in, in the talk I gave last night, I talked also about a guy named Ivan Mazeppa. Uh, Mazeppa was a figure in the 18th century who fought against Peter the Great. Um, in fact, Peter the Great branded him a traitor, and the Russian Orthodox Church declared him anathema. His soldiers were crucified along roads. I mean, he was viewed by, as, as by the Russians as a very bad guy, but he too is a hero in Ukraine, and he's on the Ten Hryvna note, the the 10 Ukrainian dollar note, uh, Hryvna it's called. Uh, so Mazepa too is another of these figures that for Russians, he's a traitor and for Ukrainians, he's a hero. He doesn't have all the contested ties of fascism, um, but there are these people in their past that they look on as um, founders of the nation. And I mean, if we wanna continue the ideology of the comparison to the Confederates, I mean, we might do the same thing with Thomas Jefferson, a uh, founding father of this country who not only owned slaves, but had a, a sexual partner um, in Sally Hemings with which he had multiple children um, and promised to free them and didn't free them. And the same thing we could talk about with, with Thomas Jefferson, uh, with George Washington, who, who had um, you know, fake teeth that were made from slaves teeth and, and things like this. RJ Thomas asks, I know that you are referencing past wars in Ukraine, like World War II, past Russian advances in the region in terms of Russian expansionism. Could this end up for Putin like the Peninsular War for, Neapol for Napoleon in Spain? He's facing a hostile population and an army not willing to concede defeat and is facing an allied force willing to take him on, but not directly as the Duke of Wellington did in Spain and Portugal. Yeah, um, there are similarities. One of the differences, though, would be that Spain during that time is not um, Spain as we think of it as a unity, but in fact, the Catalans were doing their own thing at the time. Um, and we have multiple different groups in uh, early 19th century Spain that are going to be going their own way and making their own deals with the British, for instance. Um, but there is a similarity in the sense the British were able to control the entirety of the seas, and they were able to deny... Well, for the most part, they were able to deny uh, shipping and goods going by those ways. And, and this is, you know, the, the defeat at the Nile uh, with Lord Nelson, uh, the, the um, blockade of ports at Brest and various places like that. So there is a similarity there. The, the other one that keeps coming up these days is the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Um, the most conservative estimates provided by the United States military intelligence complex are 7,000 Russian soldiers have died in the three weeks of the war. So that's 7,000 soldiers. That is more than American soldiers died in the US and in, in, uh, in the Iraq and Afghan wars combined. 
this is a lot of soldiers. And the Ukrainians are saying it's almost double that. They're saying about 13,500. Um, the Russians, of course, are saying it's less than 500. Um, but the conservative estimates of 7,000, that's a lot of troops that have been killed so far. A lot of those troops are conscripts. Uh, they don't know why they're there. They don't want to be there. And so morale issues are really causing a major problem, as well as technological issues and, and simply poor planning. Um, going to war in the spring when everything is muddy. I wrote an essay about this for a website called medievalist.net about, you know, how, um, you know, Vizzini famously says, you know, never start a land war in Asia. Um, you also don't want to go to war in Eurasia in the spring because it's too muddy. The next question is, wouldn't the U.S. returning to energy ind independence, which we were under President Trump, and becoming a major supplier to Western Europe be the best way to weaken Putin and Russia? Uh, we take so little Russian energy. Um, it's really the Europeans who take the majority. 40% of their energy comes from Russia. Something like 4 to 9% comes from the United States. Uh, and so we actually do not have very much energy independence um, uh, issues in regard to Russia. Um, so it was very easy for Biden to say, you know, we're not going to take Russian oil anymore because we can pick up some from other places. Uh, but for the, the Europeans, they take oil, they take liquid natural gas. And a lot of that is going to come from Russia. Um, and it comes through places that are actually kind of difficult to manage. So for instance, if you want to say, I don't want to take any Russian gas anymore, but I do need gas from Central Asia. Well, the, that's mixed in pipelines that are going across the Black Sea. So it becomes quite difficult. Um, some EU countries have started talking about energy independence from Russia, at least by 2027. But you know, if this is still going on in 2027, I mean, the world is going to look very different anyway. Next question is, isn't undermining NATO in order to keep the U.S. out of and get the Russians into Europe, they risk resurgent Germany, which typically hasn't been good historically for Russia? Yeah, so a, a, a colleague of mine here at the National Humanities Center said um, that last week for the first time, Olaf Scholz, the new German chancellor, was called the war chancellor, Kriegskanzler. Um, and this is new. Um, the Germans have been incredibly war averse and risk averse ever since World War II. And they have not met historically the 2% defense funding guidelines of NATO, but now they are, and now they're sending weapons to Ukraine. So this is a new Germany that we're seeing. And I think if we look in the long view, like Putin does, that he's not worried about Germany. Uh, he's worried about the West more broadly. Jesse Van Kira's follow-up question is, how is Putin going to view Germany increasing their military and military spending? Again, I don't think he's worried about Germany qua Germany. I think he's worried about the West as a whole. Um, I, I don't think there is a German focus. The US and the UK are much bigger um, ideological targets for Putin. Uh, next question is, is it an inevitability that if the Russian military were to hold up against the native militaries of the non-NATO countries that Putin wants to conquer, that the West will just quote unquote let him let him go until he succeeds in his goal in order to avoid a higher likely likelihood of nuclear war. Uh, it's certainly possible, but you know, one of the things that's really blown me away is the change in American public opinion. So I wrote a piece for the Columbus Dispatch in late January urging um, us to care about Ukraine. Uh, basically, that's what I was trying to do is get people to care about Ukraine. And at the time, there were polls from CNN that said that only about 20% of the population, the U.S. population, cared what was going on uh, in Ukraine. And now... Right. New polls just released this week show that three quarters of Americans want us to do something about Ukraine. And what that that is, is right, is not clear. It's send money, send arms. And some people are even saying send troops. But this is a huge shift that has happened in just the last month of American public opinion. So uh, Americans are very interested in helping Ukraine and they are not at all interested in befriending Russia anymore. Awesome. Let me scroll back up to the next question. After the talk, could you supply a reading list you find appropriate for the historical topics covered? 
Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Um, Holly, is it all right if you email me and I'll send you some books and then you can post them somewhere? Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And I had a couple of questions in the chat too. Um, so just for everyone's reference, this is being recorded and you can review it again later and we will send that out in an email. So um, Christian, we'll add your links to that email, okay? That sounds great. Um, and if I could add some some test questions and maybe some math <laughs> questions to that, I would really appreciate that. We'll, we'll add a math quiz. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that'd be brilliant. I know Kat <laughs> and Brad and others have been missing that. <laughs> that's great. Uh, we have a few more questions here. Um, will these events reignite the need for well-trained Russian studies majors and aspiring Russia watchers, diplomats, and analysts? Seems to me business and culture touch points are burned for a decade or more. I, I don't know that answer because I feel like I can't predict any of that stuff anymore. I thought for sure in 2014 when uh, Putin invaded Ukraine and took Crimea um, and took uh, Luhansk and Donetsk in the east, that it would absolutely re-energize funding for Russian studies, and it hasn't. I thought the same thing in 2008 when he invaded Georgia. So it's certainly possible. Um, I have a meeting with an advisee next week um, who had been planning on studying abroad in Russia next year, and now that's not going to happen. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen in that way. I mean, I... I I have many friends um, in both places in Russia and Ukraine, and I don't know what's going on with them, and I don't know if I'll ever get to go to those places again. So, you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen and what that reaction will be. Um, in Ohio, for instance, um, Jane Timken, who's running for the Republican nomination for Senate, her husband runs a company that has business with uh, freight cars um, and railroad cars in, in Russia, and that is causing her problems in the Republican Senate election in Ohio. But of course, one of her opponents, J.D. Vance, uh, is a supporter of a um, kind of right-wing uh, YouTube alternative that is being used to disseminate pro-Russian information. Uh, so, you know, there are deep ties to Russia that are still extant, even in our home state. We have a couple more questions. Um, in your opinion, should Sweden and Finland have anything to fear from Russia? Seems like they would be smart to join NATO now. It's a good question. And if they join NATO now, that just increases the idea that Putin, uh, Putin's idea that there is an uh, encirclement coming. I think, so this gets us into deep realms of speculation. And so I'm gonna foreground this by saying I'm totally speculating here. But I worry that the Western powers uh, led by the United States and the UK in particular, they are going to view Scandinavians, and I'm gonna include the Finns in this for the moment, differently than they, invade, than they view the Ukrainians or the Belarusians or the Moldovans. Um, and they would be more willing, even without membership in NATO to defend those countries and draw a red line than than they would for countries in Eastern Europe. And I, I could go into some deep historical analysis of why I think that the West doesn't care about Eastern Europe, but I'm pretty sure I'm right that they do care more about Scandinavia and the Finns than they do about what's going on in Eastern Europe. It looks like there's a couple more questions and I'm gonna combine two of Sergey's. So the uh, first one is, if and when peace talks begin, what kind of relationship would Ukraine have with NATO and then as a follow-up, would the Ukrainian people accept a peace deal where Russia gets concessions like Crimea or Donbass? Um, there's no way Ukraine will ever join NATO. Um, and, and, you know, one thing I thought a month ago, so this is three weeks we're into this war. So a month ago, I thought that President Biden would announce formally that Ukraine would never be considered for membership in NATO. Uh, and that could be a way to try and appease Putin. Um, but that didn't happen. Um, and now one of the things on the table, and President uh, Zelensky admits this, uh, is that it looks like Ukraine is not interested in NATO and vice versa. Uh, so that's something that is, I think, probably going to come to pass, right, that, that Ukraine won't join NATO. And I think Zelensky would be willing to give up some portions of territory, uh, Donbass is one, uh, Crimea is already gone, um, to have peace uh, and have that return. So I think that's probably a more likely outcome if there is going to be peace, is that Putin will need to get something from it to demonstrate that this was not a catastrophic waste of time, life, loot, et cetera. Becky has a comment, which is Professor Raffensperger put my mind somewhat more at ease with his opinion that Putin does not want a war with the West or a nuclear war. 
Good. I'm glad to hear it. I, I'm also talking to my uh, daughter's uh, middle school class uh, on Monday, and apparently her teacher, who is another WIT alum, um, I, I know I don't look old enough to have taught my daughter's teacher, but I am. Um, and she has said that the middle schoolers are very worried about nuclear war uh, and World War III. And so I'm going to go there and hopefully I can also maybe um, ease their fears a little bit too. Awesome. Uh, Linda Dion asks, can you comment on the very small piece of land between Poland and Lithuania on the Baltic Sea? How did that remain as part of Russia? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So that uh, that's Kaliningrad. Um, in the German time, it was called Konigsberg. Um, so that's a portion of territory that remained part of the Russian Empire um, and then became part of the Soviet Union and then was attached. And it was a way that the Russians wanted to have another outlet to the Baltic. And that's absolutely what it was. Uh, they wanted to have another outlet on the Baltic Sea. The Russians, if you, uh, if you look at the country as a whole, don't have great water resources. Um, because if you look at the Baltic just north of Estonia, that Gulf of Finland is pretty narrow. And in fact, you can try and set up blockades there to keep the, the Baltic fleet in. Even if you don't stop them there between Denmark and Sweden, that territory called the Katagat is another really easy area to stop them. The Black Sea in the south, you have to go through the Dardanelles and the Bosporus, which be, can be closed to their traffic. Uh, and then in the north, it's, it's the White Sea, which freezes. And so there's going to be serious problems getting out of a lot of those places. So they wanted to have another access point and, and they wanted that and they were able to make that happen. And this is part of great power politics. Great, we've got a couple more questions. Um, could you speak more about China's view of this war? Is it too reductive to think they're sympathetic to Russia's motivations because of an East versus West dichotomy? Uh, I wouldn't say it's because of that, but I think it's 100% sympathetic. And in fact, one of the things that came out after the invasion three weeks ago is that Putin had met several times with Xi Jinping uh, virtually, um, and they had signed agreements to sell gas, uh, sell Russian oil and liquid natural gas to the Chinese, right, in anticipation of those markets being closed off potentially in the West, and they'd bolster diplomatic ties. China's a little bit of a tough position because one of the things that they have staked their international reputation on is defense of sovereign borders. And this is an argument they always use against the United States with the Sixth Fleet, um, stay out of our sovereign territorial waters, don't encroach on our sovereign borders. It's one of the reasons they are building new islands in the South China Sea is to try and claim more territory for themselves. So the violation of sovereign borders causes a problem for them. However, um, having multiple fellow fellows here at the NHC um, from um, Taiwan, right? One of the things they also then worry about is that the Chinese are going to do the same thing in Taiwan and they're going to take that territory just like the Russians are trying to take Ukraine, viewing it as part of themselves that has become wayward. Um, the Chinese government is not uh, supportive of the United States' position on most things. Um, they are supportive of Russia's position on a lot of things. And even more, I think, importantly than the Chinese government position, a huge amount of Chinese people, and you see this again, I mentioned Weibo before the, the Chinese Twitter, um, average people are supportive of Putin as a strong leader and doing what he wants to do. So we're not going to see any change, I don't think, in that. So I don't think it's necessarily East-West, but I think there are very good geopolitical reasons for China to be backing Russia. Amber asks, is there a point at which Putin would give up the invasion and try again later, or do you think he'll just keep going as long as he can? I think he has to go until he gets what he wants. Um, and we're getting really mixed messages because Sergei Lavrov, his foreign minister, is talking about progress in negotiations, whereas Putin is saying there's no progress um, and there's no interest in progress. So we need, I say we, they need to find um, some way to give him what he wants so that he'll stop. Because if, if he doesn't get a concession that he's willing to accept, um, he's not going to withdraw. I mean, he will just keep going. And by going, the ground forces are almost stalled in most places. And what that means then is mass bombings of cities, 
Uh, and that's what's going to happen um, even more so. And it will spread to Western Ukraine, the right bank territories, even more than it already has, especially as the small Ukrainian Air Force gets overwhelmed. It's amazing three weeks into the war that they still have functional planes and that they still have functional anti-aircraft batteries. And it's a testament to um, not just their courage, right, which has been lauded everywhere, but their smarts uh, and the, the things they've chosen to do with the resources that they do have. We have another question. Uh, with the slaughter going on in Ukraine, will war crimes be brought up on the Russian leaders? Yes, absolutely. Um, and you know, if I had a viable social media uh, presence, I would have posted something yesterday uh, when the UN um, uh, High Court um, told Russia to stop making war on Ukraine. Like, oh my gosh, the high court told them to stop making war in Ukraine. It's all over now. Um, yes, absolutely. There will be war crimes trials, but you then have to get people to participate in that. And the Russians won't. They simply won't participate in any of that. Um, I mean, this bombing of this bombing that, that took place at the theater, um, the, the Ukrainians had painted outside the theater, Dieti, children in two different places in huge letters so that it could be seen on satellite photos. Um, and yet this was still bombed and this was a shelter. So uh, the Russians aren't interested. And I say the Russians, it's not the Russians, it's Putin. This is Putin's war. It's not the average Russians war, um, but they won't be interested. He won't be interested in certainly in standing trial for anything. Nelly Dreyfus says, very quickly in these discussions, we get down to questions of what makes a state, what makes a nation, what makes an empire, Ukraine, of course, but also Taiwan, Ibiza, or the EU, and exploring gradients of sovereignty. Do you think this is the key philosophical question of the conflict? And if so, being a philosophical conflict, does that not make a cheap and dirty peace underpinned, say, by an exchange of territory less likely? It, it's certainly possible, um, given that the Ukrainian identity is stronger now than it's ever been, that they will be willing to say, we want to preserve Ukraine's identity, its sovereignty, its territoriality in any way we can, even if that means giving up certain parts of our physical territory. Um, but the question you're raising, I think, is a really interesting and wider question. I think what Zelensky's negotiators are looking for is a way to make the bombing stop right now. Um, and for instance, I've been really critical uh, of the peace, uh, the Dayton Peace Accords that, that made peace in the Balkans in the 1990s uh, because of the terms. Uh, but the pushback I've gotten from some of the negotiators there is we were trying to make the bombing stop. We were trying to make the killing stop any way we could. Um, we weren't looking for a perfect solution. We were looking for a solution at that moment. So uh, this could be the same in this situation. It wouldn't be a perfect solution, but it'd be a way to make the bombing stop. From Beth, uh, class of 73, this has been outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. And then we've got um, Charles mentioning Peace in Our Time. I think we've all seen that movie. Um, we have a, another question here from Sergey. Is Putin... Serge. <laughs> sorry, Serge, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Serge asks, is Putin content with the Russian army taking a reputational hit as a fighting force? This can't be a good look for a man who prides himself on strength. Uh, no, he is not OK with it at all. In fact, he had two of his senior ministers arrested this week uh, for providing faulty intelligence. And the, the rumor going around is that he's going to say that they were fed faulty intelligence by the West. Um, but in fact, they just told him what he wanted to hear, that the Ukrainians were going to roll over and that, yes, they totally thought they were going to be, you know, happy being Russians. Um, but they didn't do their job of telling truth to power. Um, and, you know, no shock if you tell truth to Putin, he doesn't like it. So why would you do that? Um, so, but yes, he's already looking for scapegoats. Charles asks, what risks, if any, does Putin face of his own command and control chains breaking down as the stakes of the conflict increase? 
boy, that is, that's the million dollar question. Um, three generals, three Russian generals have already been killed. There's some debate about whether a fourth has been killed during this campaign. They're moving the generals closer to the theaters of operations in Ukraine to try and motivate the troops, which are having serious morale problems, um, but that makes them more liable to be killed. Putin doesn't have a constituency. Um, this is one of the things that makes it hard to really affect him. So the sanctions are a wonderful display of the West uniting uh, in, in on behalf of Ukraine, uh, but they don't affect Putin too terribly much. Um, and they're not going to create a mass uprising in the population to overthrow him or something like that. The 15,000 people who've turned out already to protest, I mean, they're heroes uh, because they face 15 years in prison just for protesting or even for calling this a war in Russia. The vast majority of Russians who oppose the war and have the financial means are leaving, right? They're not trying to overthrow the government. They're leaving and they're going to places that they can get into. Um, and most of them don't have Schengen zone passports to get into the EU. So they're going to Turkey, they're going to Georgia, they're going to Kazakhstan and places like that. Um, so I think it's actually a very minimal chance that somebody is going to overthrow Putin. TWK asks, do you see someone doing something internally in Russia to stop the war? I feel like that's probably unlikely. Um, Putin, I think, is in serious control. He has surrounded himself with a group of people who are from his KGB days of past, which in Russian are called the Siloviki, um, and they are controlling the government. And, and really, he is a strong man. Odin says Serbia had a partnership of peace. Is that a model? Oh, I suppose it's certainly possible. Um, once we get into the Balkans, we get into a whole other can of worms. And so models there are difficult because the interconnected nature of Balkan politics um, is unlike what we're seeing in Russia and Ukraine, I think. Michael Richardson also asks a similar question to the previous one. Is there any chance that Russian armed forces or GRU might assassinate Putin to end this? I think it's incredibly unlikely. And then we've got another question. The questions keep coming in. Um, do you think Putin's hold on power is secure? What will happen in Russia domestically since many are willing to protest and the Kremlin openly said many in Russia are behaving like traitors? Yeah, um, so I don't think anything internally will happen. I think Putin is happy that so many of the people who protest against this war are either going to go to jail or going to leave. Um, the people who are going to be the ones who are behind, who stay behind, um, are going to be ones who support him more likely. And so he's going to be able to solidify his power base because of the mass exodus of people who are connected to the West or who are dissatisfied with his policies, which ends up strengthening him. And this looks like the last question in the chat, actually. So Emma asks, I know you can't read Putin's mind, but I'm wondering if Putin truly thought Ukrainians wanted to be Russians or if that was simply an excuse for an invasion. Oh, Emma, leave little faith. I can. OK, I can't really. I apologize. Um, but yes, I really do think he thought that. Um, and I think that that is a great Russian mindset that's gone back for a long time is that the little Russians and even the condescending nature of little Russians, um, oh, the little Russians, they just, they, you know, they think they're Ukrainians. It's so cute, uh, but really they're just Russians. Uh, I, I really do think that he believed that. And because of his power, because his yes men surround him, because of his increasing isolation over the last two years, there was no one to tell him any different. And so these ideas that he has, well, why not make them fact? If you are the leader of a, a, a nation with an army and you've got ideas, go for it. I, I think that's what's going on in his head. Kat Eifert says, Raf, thank you for teaching me so well that I have been able to and can continue to educate people about this topic as it continues to progress. You are welcome. It's been a delight to see you again today. It's been a delight to see so many of my former students and to meet new people who are WIT alums. Uh, thank you all for turning out. Boy, Holly, we managed this on a pretty good time. I think this was great. Thank you so much for everything that you put together today. 
this has been terrific. And, and y'all can find my information on the WIT website if you want to reach out uh, and email me. I'm also going to post some resources with Holly uh, along with the recording of this so that all of you can continue to read up. I'm always happy to provide book recommendations. Um, in the meantime, before we get those resources posted, you could look at the WIT History Department Twitter or Instagram. I've posted some book recommendations there in the past couple of weeks as well. Wonderful. Thank you everybody for joining us today. We truly appreciate the time you spent with us and look for the follow-up email that contains all the information. Take care. Thanks all. Thank you, Dr. Raffensperger. Bye. Bye.